Okay, continuing on with our hemodynamics lecture. I would say the next mm, 10 slides, 11 slides or so are actually pretty easy and should be somewhat review from anatomy depending on how well your professor lectured on parts of the brain or not. Um, but when we're talking about control of cardiac rate and force of contraction, the parts of the brain that are in charge of that would come from the medulla oblongata. And in the medulla oblongata, there are a couple of nuclei. The definition of a nucleus is a collection of neuronal cell bodies inside the central nervous system that share a common function. So in the medulla oblongata, we have the cardioaccelatory center. Guess what that does to heart rate? It increases it. Which autonomic division would you think it would be part of? Good. And there's a cardioinhibitory center. What do you think that does to heart rate? Decreases. And which autonomic division would that be a part of? Parasympathetic. Good. And then there's also a vasomotor center. And a vasomotor center is going to cause the tunica media that's found in blood, ve blood vessels, even in veins, to start to contract. And that means put more pressure on the blood inside. Which division do you think that would be under the guise of? Sympathetic again. And Sarah, that goes right along with the question that you asked on Monday. Okay. Now to review lecture unit two, we know that most blood vessels of the body are under the control of the sympathetic division. And if we look down here, we see a postganglionic sympathetic neuron discharging on the tunica media. If the action potentials increase in time, we know from our PhysioX, the last exercise of the NeuroPhysioX, the more stimulus, the more the discharge. The more the discharge, the more the neurotransmitter released. In this case, it would be more epinephrine released on the alpha-1 receptor, and the tunica media would contract, and we would get vasoconstriction. More pressure on the blood inside. Systemically, that means we would bring pressure up, but locally, that would mean less blood through that vessel. If the postganglionic neuron does not discharge as much, then the tunica media with its alpha-1 receptors would not be responding as robustly, and the smooth muscle fibers would relax, we would get vasodilation. That would lead to more blood flow through that vessel, but systemically, if all the blood vessels did that, our blood pressure would go down. And for treating blood pressure, high blood pressure, that's how some medications target. They want more blood vessels to vasodilate. Systemically, the pressure goes down, but through a vessel, blood flow would go up. So we have to keep those two things separate. In lab today, one of the experiments you're going to do is to assess your central venous pressure. I did lecture on that on Monday. Central venous pressure is the amount of blood pressure in your right atrium. Blood will only flow from high pressure to low. So if we want blood to flow out of the left ventricle through the systemic circuit, back to the right atrium, then we need a continuous pressure gradient. And the right atrial pressure should be zero. Well, what if it's not? And how would the brain even know that? There are a few places where we have pressure receptors. Let me tell you about two places that are very important. There are pressure receptors in the aortic arch and in the common carotid. The common carotid is a space 
right before the external and internal carotid arteries bifurcate. And the space right before they bifurcate is called the carotid sinus. So in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus, we have something called baroreceptors. These are pressure receptors. They are modified nerve endings. They respond to stimuli, just like any other neuron would. If the ventricle, the left ventricle, contracts harder and ejects more blood volume, there would be more stretch in these elastic arteries. And the baroreceptor nerve endings would detect this stretch, this pressure. And just like any other nerve ending, if they have more stimulus, they would fire more frequent action potentials. I, right now, am solving two rows of questions in your lab manual. So if they are firing more frequently up to the brain, saying we have too much pressure, too much stroke volume, what do you think the brain would communicate back down to the heart? Would it be, you lazy son of a bitch? Or would it be, you're so good at this. I'm good at, yes, you're good at it. You're so good at this pump thing. You should take a break in between contractions. What do you think? Which one? It would be, you're so good. Take a break. So if the heart is more vigorous as a pump, and these stretch receptors are detecting this increased stroke volume and sending lots of action potentials up to the brain, then the medulla oblongata is gonna send an output command through the cardio inhibitory center. As if to say, you're so good at this. Oh my gosh, take a break. So heart rate would go down. But if the heart is weak as a pump, then these baroreceptors would not detect as much stretch. Then they won't fire as many action potentials. And then the medulla oblongata is collecting this information and it's gonna send an output command to the heart that's gonna say, you lazy son of a bitch. If you can't be bothered to get a good stroke volume, you're gonna have to do double time. And that means the cardio accelatory center will be instigated, heart rate will go up, and so will the vasomotor center to get more pressure on the blood inside. We will elicit responses from both parts of the medulla oblongata that are part of the sympathetic division. Some of the weird experiments that they did, they took dogs and they took clamps and they put these clamps around the carotid arteries. And what that meant was to the carotid sinus bear receptors, there wasn't as much blood flow to them. And those carotid sinus bear receptors did not detect as much stretch. And they sent their action potentials less frequently up to the brain. And the brain re replied saying, you lazy son of a bitch. And we saw in real time that the blood pressure in these dogs went up, trying to compensate to keep the pressure on the blood inside, to keep driving the blood through the vasculature. When the clamps were removed, then blood flow was restored and the blood pressure in those dogs went back down to normal. Tonight, you're going to be mucking with these baroreceptors. You are going to do an experiment where you're either laying down on the table, calm blue ocean, and raising your arm, or you're gonna be laying down on the table, holding your breath, and trying to pretend that you're going big potty and raising your arm. And your baroreceptors are going to respond differently 
in those two instances. When I'm done with this lecture, I will then come back and clarify those two techniques for the experiment, and I will show you on a picture what is happening into your heart and your baroreceptors and your brain and how your body is trying to compensate. That is part of the learning process, and I warned you on Monday that this week you're going to learn how to poo correctly. And just so we're clear, pooing on the bathroom floor <laughs> is not <laughs> correct. Or if it sounds correct, that if they're making steps towards the right direction. It's disgusting. I still find it funny. I was like, oh, and this poor girl was washing her hands. It wasn't me. Is she serious? Well, she didn't even know. And I opened the stall doors like, who does that? And she's like, it wasn't me. I, I know it wasn't you. I'm the one hanging up the sign. It's disgusting. Now, these bear receptors, they save you when you're going from a supine position to a standing position or even a sitting position to a standing position. Have you ever gotten up too quickly and you felt a little lightheaded? Welcome to my world. As you get older, when you're on the floor playing with your little cousins or grandchildren, cousins like I do, little cousins, I'm their aunt really. I'm playing with them and I have to get up. There's no like, let me just jump right up. It's, here's Kara. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. And my husband watches me and goes, you're not even 50! <laughs> I feel like I'm 80. <laughs> As you age, your baroreceptors do not compensate or signal the brain to compensate as quickly as they used to. Even in your youth, I'm sure you've gotten up too quickly and you went, oh, I got lightheaded. And it's because when you stood up quickly, there was a momentary gravitational pull that pulled your blood more towards your legs, less blood getting to your brain, and your brain wasn't being perfused as well. And so you went, oh. But eventually, within a second or two, your brain compensated thanks to the signals coming to the brain from your baroreceptors, and your brain got the vasomotor activity to get back up to par. You restored pressure on the blood, you sent more blood to your brain, and you were able to conduct your business. But some people, their baroreceptors don't signal right at all. And when they try and stand up from a seated position, laying down position, doesn't matter, they have what's called orthostatic hypotension. And that simply means that their baroreceptor reflex arc is not compensating in real time. So if they stand up too quickly, they're hitting the floor, they're passing out. We say they fainted. And we might say, oh, is it too hot in here? They didn't eat. It's none of that. It's their baroreceptor reflex arc not computing in real time. So if we want to figure out if it's the baroreceptors or is it really that they're too hot or they weren't eating, we can do what's called a tilt table test. This person is on a tilt table. The table, you, you put the patient down, horizontal. It's very important that you strap them in. You can see the straps on this patient. And the tilt table test is exactly that. You undo this little knob and you bring the table up and make the person come into a vertical position. And as you tilt the table, you monitor them for when they start to pass out because they're not getting enough blood flow to their brain. That's the reason why you need to make sure they're strapped in because you don't want to be that nurse that forgets that step and as you tilt the table they slide off and bonk their head on the floor. That's a lawsuit waiting to happen. There are many reasons why someone can have orthostatic hypotension. Age is one. 
but also an adverse reaction to any medication they might be on. All of us have heard on commercials, serious side effects include blah, 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 blah. Have you ever heard those commercials? And you might have thought, why the hell would anyone take that drug? It sounds awful to be on that drug. And what they don't tell you is that they're obligated to tell you about these serious side effects, but they don't tell you the percentage of people that had them. You don't know if it was 1%, 5%, 15%, 20%, they don't tell you the percentages, they just have to tell you what the serious side effects could be. So adverse reactions to medication. This is another good one. Prolonged bed rest. Inactivity. If you have a loved one that was on prolonged bed rest and all of a sudden they say, I can do it myself, and they just want to spring out of bed, uh -uh. you need a person on either side. They need support. They cannot, after weeks in bed rest, think that they can just, oh, I'm fine. The baroreceptors for weeks have been, oh, this is amazing. We don't have to fight gravity at all. And then all of a sudden they sit up and stand up and the baroreceptors are still on vacation. And they're going, wait, what? We're back to work again? Who sent out that? I wasn't aware, were you aware? I wasn't aware. And then that person hits the floor and they're right back on bed rest again, aren't they? they. So prolonged bed rest, if you go to a good nursing school, you should have a class where they addressed prolonged bed rest and how the physiology in the body changes because it does. It's not just the baroreceptors, the lungs, how you get gas exchange also changes if someone is reclining in a bed versus getting up and doing day-to-day -day activity. It's different. And some nursing schools have an entire class dedicated to addressing the changes in the body if someone is on bed rest for a long period of time. The physiology does change. This is a fun flow chart and one that you will probably want to reference tonight during your lab. If the blood pressure rises, baroreceptors will detect more pressure, stretch, they will fire more frequently. That means more information, action potential, sent to the medulla oblongata, to the cardiac centers and vasomotor centers. We will want to provoke the parasympathetic division, so heart rate should go down. We will want to inhibit the cardioaccelatory center, also commanded by the sympathetic division. We would want to shut that down. We would also want to shut down the vasomotor center and have more vasodilation. Reduced heart rate, more vasodilation means blood pressure would go down. Now we can do the reverse. If blood pressure were to go down below normal, the baroreceptors would detect less stretch, they would fire less frequently, this would stimulate the cardioaccelatory center and the vasomotor center, and inhibit the cardioinhibitory center. In other words, if blood pressure goes down, we would want to provoke the sympathetic centers of the medulla oblongata. These two examples of this reflex arc of the baroreceptors will be part of your experiments tonight. I don't ask you a question on this, but I want you to know in the same places where we have baroreceptors, in the aortic arch and carotid sinus, we also have chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors will respond to the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide. This will be hugely important in lecture unit four when we study lung function. 
So we're going to come right back to the aortic arch and carotid sinus in Unit 4. And our focus in Unit 4 will be the chemoreceptors. And again, they're going to monitor the levels of CO2 and oxygen in the plasma. I do not ask you a question on that for Lecture Unit 3. It's all about Unit 4. Another reflex arc that responds to pressure is called the Bainbridge reflex arc. And the Bainbridge reflex arc involves pressure receptors in the right atrium. These are not baroreceptors, but they are like them. They detect, they respond to degrees of stretch. If you have more blood flow returning to the right atrium, you would have more stretch of the atrial fibers. And as a result, the brain would interpret this as such. If I have more stretch in the right atrium, that means I've had more venous return. If I suddenly have more venous return, it must mean that the body is doing something where we need more flow of blood. So if there's more blood returning in the very next beat, the heart rate and force of contraction are going to kick up. As if to say to you, we can't afford to have, as Christine said on Monday, blood pooling. If it's coming back, get it right back out. Let's go, let's go, let's go, people. And that's the Bainbridge reflex arc. Now, if you're really studying well for next week's exam, you might start to put together in a list all the reflex arcs that I'm going through. And you might start to realize that some of these reflex arcs seem to be antagonistic to each other. For example, in the baroreceptor reflex arc that I just described, if they detect more stretch, you just heard me say, that heart rate and force of contraction would go down. And in this one, you just heard me say that if more venous return occurs and the atrial stretch receptors detect more stretch, then heart rate and force of contraction go up. So which one is it? Which one wins? Tyler, look at him, look at him, look at him, my little Hermione. Instantly, the worry just went, he was like, I will never, never ask you a question to pit one against the other. The question will always say something like, consider the baroreceptor reflex arc. Then that's all you consider, and I'm only asking you how it would work. Or another question might say, consider the Bainbridge reflex arc. Then that's all you consider. If Bainbridge and you detect more stretch, what would happen to heart rate and contraction? Goes up. You don't want blood to dam up. If baroreceptor more stretch detected, then we would have heart rate and force of contraction go down. I will never never ask you to pit one against the other. And in fact, the first two weeks of school, when we were going through ho the homeostasis lecture, I said to you all, eventually there will be a part in the semester where you might get frustrated because you will learn about a lot of different pathways that are either redundant or antagonistic to each other. And you might say to me, Kara, which one is winning? And I'll say, mm-hmm. You don't remember that, do you? Because it was like 12 weeks, 13 weeks ago, if you count spring break. But I did say those words. So here we are. You're at that point in the semester. I just told you back to back two reflex arcs that seem antagonistic to each other. And they both might be on at the same time. And you might say, well, which one's winning? And my loves, that is the reason why the cardiovascular system is so difficult. Because from one beat to the next, compensation is occurring. 
one system's winning, the other one's winning, the other one's winning. It's from one beat to the next that compensation is being adjusted. You cannot speak in long term saying which one's winning right now. Uh, in this beat, it's this one. In the next one, it'll be the other one. It's fluctuating back and forth in real quick time. So the bear was such a reflex if if it's detecting an increase in pressure due to a higher stroke volume, mm -hmm. why would the contractility go down along with the heart rate? Because if contractility is robust, you get a good stroke volume, and that would create more stretch on the aortic vessel wall. You want, if there was a robust contraction to begin with, the resulting output would be, you're so good at that, take a break. Okay, so we're... So then the parasympathetic division would take control. Parasympath... I know, I know what question you're asking. Parasympathetic... Parasympathetic division has little to no effect on contraction, on inotropy. But if we're swinging more control to the parasympathetic division, we are also taking away control from the sympathetic. And here's what you're doing right now in your brain, because I can see. You're now starting to think, well, what if the heart naturally has a really good force of contraction? How do we do that? I'm not talking about an exercised heart. I'm not even inviting that. I'm saying, let's, let's play with a couch potato that doesn't have hypertrophy of the left ventricular wall beyond normal. In that case, not a well-trained heart, you're gonna see moment to moment changes in which division has control. Again, do not overthink. Do not. I'm really good about the questions in this unit. Consider this. And even when my Hermione students start to go, but if you read the answer choices carefully and critically, you will realize Mm, Kara's not even entertaining that. I know that. I can tell from the answers. I promise. I've been doing this for a long time. Okay. Do you all need a break? Are you sure? Because these last 10, 11 slides are a doozy. So do you have to pee? Do you have to poo? Don't poo on the floor. <laughs> Don't poo like this. <laughs> Breathe through it. You're all good? Okay, then get your homework packet out. Okay, the capillaries are called the exchange vessels. Why? This is where we're going to have gas exchange, oxygen coming out of the plasma, even out of the red blood cell into the plasma, into the interstitial space, into the cell, into the mitochondrion. We will also have exchange of nutrients for other metabolic wastes like beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetic acid. So nutrients and oxygen go out, waste products and CO2 gases come in. <coughs> the reason why we get these exchanges is due to physical pressures. We're gonna focus right now 
on the movement of plasma from the plasma compartment out of the capillary bed into the interstitial space and into the cytoplasm. The movement of this fluid from the plasma into the interstitial space and subsequently into the cytoplasm or from the cytoplasm to the interstitial space into the plasma, the movement of this fluid is due to physical forces. These are measurable. They are, they are not just imaginary. The movement of gases, we will cover that in unit four. So right now we're talking about the movement of the fluids from one compartment to the next. And in unit one, you were taught about your body fluid compartments. Well, guess what? You have got to come right back to them. We start with body fluid compartments in this semester, and we're going to finish with them. So I'm going to tell you about the microcirculation. Simply put, that means how do we get this fluid exchange from one compartment to the next? <clears throat> and I have to tell you about your Starling forces. When we're talking about the exchange <coughs> of gases <coughs> from red blood cells and plasma to the tissue cells, that is from gas gradients and pressure gradients, or partial pressure gradients. We'll deal with that in Unit 4. Right now, we're talking about the fluid exchange from the plasma to the interstitium, to the cytoplasm, or reverse. The forces that dictate are either push or pull. Push or pull. What's our pushing force? It's a hydrostatic force. Yours is not, but I think Ryan's. It's water, not body, right? <laughs> <laughs> Our push force, hydrostatic. The water in a vessel pushes out on the vessel, and the vessel wall pushes in on the water inside. Everything I'm doing to this bottle of water and how the water is moving is because of hydrostatic pressure. What's the other reason why that water moves? Osmotic, and that's your pulling pressure. And again, all of this was told to you the first lecture unit. So across a capillary, when we're talking about the exchange of fluid, we're talking about the movement of water, and water moves for one of two reasons. Either a push, hydrostatic, or a pull, particles suck. Remember that? And that's osmotic pressure. Yay, we get to come back to that. Did you burn lab unit one? Did you burn the first 20 pages? Did you think you were done with the chemistry calculations? You were wrong. You better get that back. Phone a friend. You're going to have to calculate osmolality again in unit four. So let this be a warm up for you. Across the capillary vessel, why do we get fluid moving? Either a push or a pull. There are two forces that are in the capillary and two forces that are outside of the capillary. Let's pretend the following. Let's pretend this space between the tables represents the capillary where blood flow is moving. Let's pretend you all out here, you are the cells of the tissue bed. As blood flows through the capillary bed, you all want nutrients and oxygen. And those move down their concentration <coughs> areas. That's diffusion, that was unit two. But you also need the interstitial fluid, the fluid in between you, to be renewed. Have you ever had a fish before? 
Did you ever have a fish in an aquarium? A single fish, a goldfish, a beta fish? What do you know about fish in their aquarium? Can you just let them swim in the same water indefinitely? Why can't you? Why does it get dirty? They poop, they pee, and all of the waste products accumulate. And you need to flush that out. You need to put new fresh water in. Now, side note, I'm gonna pause this. Your aquarium that needs to be cleaned out. You need to have new fluid replace the old. Bring new nutrition, new gases. Everything needs to be exchanged and, and just freshened up. Okay, well water moves for one of two reasons. Two of these forces are inside the capillary and two are outside. Two are going to be pushing forces, hydrostatic, and two will be osmotic, pulling, particles suck. Let's start with the two forces in the capillary. You are water going through the capillary. You are pushing on the capillary wall. This is definitely a force pushing out. If I were to take your water bottles and put a hole in the bottom of your water bottle, what would happen to the water in your water bottle? Why would it leak out? What pressure? It's pushing out, isn't it? That's why the water leaks out. The force is out. Okay, the other pressure in the capillary comes from albumin. Let's go back in time to unit one. What organ makes albumin? Liver. Albumin is an important component of plasma. It is a pulling component. It is a particle. And so albumin, being a very important protein in the plasma, the most abundant protein in the plasma, it cannot get through the capillary walls very easily. <clears throat> it has a hard time getting through the intracellular clefts. So it acts like a particle to hold fluid in the plasma, in the capillary. And I'll remind you, you already know this. You already know this. It was unit one, Kwashiorkor with the little kid. She didn't have a good diet. She couldn't make albumin quite right. And she didn't have enough albumin to keep the plasma in her plasma compartment. So it leaked out into her, her peritoneal cavity and she had that big belly, didn't she? And you all called that edema, ascites. She did not have enough pulling power in her capillary. So in the capillary, we have an outgoing pressure and an incoming pulling pressure. So right up here, here's your plasma, plasma colloid osmotic pressure. Colloid means protein. You knew that from unit one when I told you about the thyroid hormone made from thyroglobulin. We forget, we forget unit one. You do not have the luxury to forget anything in this class. You want to go into the healthcare profession. Sorry, you can't delete anything. In textbooks, if we want you to think of colloid osmotic pressure, particles that are protein pulling water, we use the pi symbol. I will not use the pi symbol. If you look at your homework packet on page two, I actually write out capillary colloid osmotic pressure, letter C. Do you see that? I write it out. That means you don't have to memorize the symbols. Capillary hydrostatic pressure, pushing pressure. It favors outward movement of fluid. Okay. <clears throat> what about the two pressures in the interstitial space? Okay. Let's do the colloid pressure. Cells 
have gene expression. They make proteins. And many times cells will put proteins out through the cell membrane into the interstitial space. A lot like you all with your book bags right now. Think of your book bags, because you all are tissue cells. You brought your book bags. Think of that as proteins, and they have pulling pressure. So they're going to pull fluid from the plasma to them. Clearly, that would be antagonistic to the colloid osmotic pressure in the capillary. Then there's fluid in between all these cells. There's interstitial hydrostatic pressure. And if you look at the picture, the picture shows it that it would be pushing into the capillary. But it doesn't. And here's why. Most capillary beds, most tissue beds, have another unique vessel that is there in between. And I'll, I'll show you, it's here in this classroom. Right here. The drain in the floor. If we have a leak from the ceiling and we get a whole bunch of fluid all around you all, on Monday you were afraid that something was going to fall down on you, weren't you? It's happened in this classroom. And if you look right here, this is one of the biggest culprits. There's another one over there and one in the back. Another one there, another one there. Turns out when people built this building, they built the drains in the floor. They didn't connect them to pipes. So the technicians <coughs> went and checked the showers. Water all over the floor, and they cleaned up. And they pushed all the water to the drain in the chemistry labs above. There was no pipe going to the sewer. And it all came raining down in my classroom. Tiles fell down. So think of the pipes here as your lymphatic drainage. If they're working correctly, any fluid here should not be being pushed into the capillary. It should drain out. So even though Guyton Hall says, in theory, in theory, the interstitial hydrostatic pressure should be pushing on the vessel wall. It's not, because the lymphatic drainage is, is draining that fluid. So this pressure is not a positive pressure, it's negative. All of these pressures that I just described have have values. They are measurable forces. Do not memorize their values. Do not. Here is what I expect you to do. On the last slide in this one, I merely define the four pressures that I just went through. I tell you if they push inward, pull inward or pull outward, Know if they're a push or a pull. Know if they favor inward or outward movement of fluid from the plasma to the interstitial fluid. That's our perspective. Do they favor outward movement of the fluid or inward? That's your job. So let's look at these forces from the, those lenses. We have four forces, two in the capillary, two in the interstitial space. Okay, in the capillary, which one favors out? Hydrostatic. Good. So that's an outward force. What about capillary colloid? Is that out? In. Okay, so we have one out, one in. <coughs> Okay, what about the interstitial? We have colloid interstitial. Out, good, so now we have two to one, agreed? Two to one. What about interstitial hydrostatic pressure? Knowing that we have lymphatic drainage. 
out? It pulls out, right? So it's a suction. The force was negative. How does a straw work? You're sitting at the table, you're trying to drink your drink. You try to defy gravity. You create a vacuum, a negative force in your mouth. And that is why the fluid goes from the bottom of your cup up defying gravity into your mouth. You are creating a negative hydrostatic force. You are creating a vacuum. And that's what lymphatic drainage does. So now we have three to one. Three forces that favor outward movement of fluid from the capillary to the interstitial space, and only one that favors inward, don't we? Well, let's pit them against each other. Let's look at our outward pressures. We have capillary hydrostatic, we have interstitial hydrostatic, the lymphatic drainage. We have interstitial osmotic pressure. These are measurable forces. Here are their numbers. Let me add them all up together because they work together. Do not memorize the numbers. There's only one that favors inward movement, capillary colloid osmotic pressure. Okay, now we just pit numbers against each other. Which force wins, out or in? I should say, which direction wins? Out, but not by much, would you agree? Not by much, but it's enough. That 0.3 millimeters of mercury of a pressure difference favoring outward movement means that at the end of a 24 hour day, two to four liters of plasma will leave your capillary beds and go into your interstitial space. And if you are not able to recollect that fluid and put it back into your blood vessels, you all would be dead at the end of the day. How much blood volume do we have? About five liters. How much of it is plasma? Roughly half, 55%. So at the end of the day, if you lost two to four liters, you would lose your entire volume of plasma into your interstitial space. By the end of the day, you would have nothing but red blood cells in your vessels. How would they tumble along? They wouldn't. You'd have nothing but sludge in your vessel. You would be dead at the end of the day. But thankfully, we have vessels whose job it is to collect all of this leaked fluid, dump it right back into your subclavian veins, right back into your cardiovascular system. They are called your lymphatic vessels. That's their job, is to collect this leaked fluid. <clears throat> so when we consider these four forces, we recognize that three favor out, one favors in. If you go back to the previous slide, I could ask you, which two forces are the strongest? Capillary hydrostatic pressure. Where'd you, where'd you get that answer, Matt? He looked at which numbers were highest. <laughs> he looked at which number was highest. What's the other highest one, Matt? The capillary colloid. Colloid. So the two forces that are the strongest come from the capillary. Capillary hydrostatic favors outward, capillary colloid favors inward. Those are the two biggest. Those are the two biggest. Those are the ones that could change the most. The interstitial doesn't really change. Why can capillary hydrostatic pressure change? Blood volume, good. Oh, okay, that, keep going. 
You, it was your question. <gasps> Good! Vasoconstriction. So it can change quite drastically. Everyone chug water. Come on, cheers. We just increase our blood volume. Give it 20 minutes. No one pee. Squeeze it in. Capillary colloid osmotic pressure. Albumin. Now we can't really change that very quickly, but we know it can change, don't we? Dietary issues, liver <laughs> issues. This was so unit one. But the interstitial doesn't change because the interstitial comes from the cells. Cells are happy being cells. They don't really, they don't change really what they make when we're talking about a tissue bed. So it's the capillary forces that we should focus on. Okay, <clears throat> here is a capillary bed. Here is the arterial end. Here is the venous end. Blood will only flow from high pressure to low. The pressure is higher at the arterial end. Why? That's right, it's closer to the heart. Why is it lower at the venous end? It's further away from the heart. So we have capillary hydrostatic pressure, blood pressure, dropping across the length of the capillary. Okay. So it's constantly declining. If you want blood to flow from one vessel to the next, then the next vessel has to have a lower pressure than the preceding vessel. Do you remember that from Monday? Probably not, because you were la, 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 EKG, <clears throat> and you weren't paying attention. Now, capillary colloid osmotic pressure, albumin, that doesn't really change from moment to moment. It stays pretty steady state. <clears throat> so look at this. At the arterial end, which force wins? Capillary hydrostatic pressure. Which way does that force move fluid? Out. So at the arterial end, fresh nutrients, fresh water coming. Oh my gosh, you all need it. Here! And then as we get to the venous side, the capillary hydrostatic pressure drops below the pulling pressure. And that's when the, the plasma says, now give me all your waste. Give me all your waste. We drop off the fresh, and then we pick up the waste. Isn't that genius? <clears throat> There's another part to this filtration equation. How much filtrate do you have seeping out of the capillary? These pressures here are the four I just taught you. Again, I don't ask you to remember the symbols. I write them out. But this equation, you don't have to do anything with it. All I ask you to know is which forces favor out, which favors in, Hit them against each other. KF represents the permeability of a capillary bed. And on Monday, I told you about the three different kinds of capillaries. And I said continuous was the most abundant but least permeable. That means its KF was down. Sinusoidal. They were least abundant, but they were the most permeable. Their KF is high. You do not need to worry about KF too much until we get to unit four. The permeability, the leakiness of a capillary can be manipulated. And histamine is the number one way to do that. How many of you have allergies? What happens when you have allergies? <clears throat> okay, yes, you have increased histamine, but you didn't know that till you took this class. You somewhat did because you knew to take an antihistamine, but what is the most annoying thing about your allergies? Vasodilation in your nose, 
can't breathe at night, the watery eyes, it's the water. Where's the water coming from? Capillaries. Why is the water dripping out of your capillaries into down your nose, out of your face? Why is it just dripping? And it's because the KF went up. So next time you're just, have you ever had that moment where your nose is just dripping like a faucet and you're like a first grader all over again? You're like, where is the Kleenex? It's just <laughs> dripping. I want you to go, excuse me, damn KF. <laughs> it's increased permeability. When you take an antihistamine, you are returning the KF back to what it should be, a lower number. You're shutting off the faucet, Matt. Again, lymphatic vessels are interdigitated between traditional capillary beds. They are like the French drain in the floor. Lymphatic vessels have valves. They are similar to veins, but they do not have a pump, and they do not complete a circuit, not like arteries to veins back to the heart. There is no circuit. And because they don't have a heart, there is no official pump. If I were to stand here, especially on a two, actually, last semester, I taught, <coughs> you know how you all sign up for classes and you say, I'm taking so many units. How many of you have less than 12 units? How many of you have 12 to 15 units? How many of you have 15 to 18 units? 18 to 21. 21 to 24. More than 24. Could you imagine taking more than 24? I was teaching almost 27 units. And that's about equivalent to you taking almost 27 units. Could you imagine? Now imagine taking almost 27 units only in two days. What would your day look like in those two days? If they were all science classes with lecture and lab. Could you be here from 7 in the morning until 10 at night? Welcome to my job. I was on my feet from seven in the morning until 10 at night. My breaks were about half hour breaks twice a day for office hours. By the end of the day, standing on my feet, I would come home, my shoes would not be slipping like this. My feet would be so swollen by the end of the day. Why? I was standing, gravitational pull, more blood in the capillary beds in my feet, higher hydrostatic pressure from the capillary, more edema. My feet were swollen. Well, Kara, why didn't your lymphatic vessels drain that back up to your subclavian vein? Where are my feet? Here. Where are my subclavian veins? Here. How many feet is that in difference? about five feet. Defying gravity. And if I'm standing and not going, hey, 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 <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. let's ever do aerobics. <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> That's how I put myself through graduate school. I taught aerobics. <laughs> Hey, let's go. Hey, hey, let's go. Oh, give me five, four, three, two, one, and great fun. Hey, 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 hey. Huh, uh -huh. Give me some attitude. Huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, if I did that all day, I wouldn't have swollen feet. But I didn't do that all day. Maybe you should have teached uh, probably like 29 in the Zuma class. Yeah. The kinesiology department doesn't want me over there. They're like, Kara, your music is too antiquated. 
none of this 80s shit. <laughs> no, I don't need water, I need to get air. <laughs> So that's your skill to muscle pump. <laughs> it helps push the blood back up through the lymphatic vessels, way back up to your subclavian vein. Did any of you ever dissect your thoracic gut? Yes. Yes. They're trying to, did, yes. You did. It was this creamy structure right next to the abdominal and thoracic aorta, and it looked like pearls on a string. Again, lymphatic vessels don't have a pump. It's only through movement where the muscles, when they contract, they help push the lymphatic fluid back up to the subclavian veins. If you stand on your feet and you don't move, you're gonna have edema in your feet. Lymphatic fluid is very close to plasma fluid, but it's not identical. It has all the electrolytes, glucose, hormones. It can even have viruses, fragments of cells that have been destroyed, but it's not identical to plasma. It's actually reduced in protein content compared to plasma. So we have to call it lymphatic fluid. Now imagine if you didn't move around at the end of the day, all day long, and instead of your feet swelling, ladies, your labia majora just was like, yeah. Look at Elizabeth. <laughs> Could you imagine if all your lymphatic fluid was just like, honey, I'm home. <laughs> and yet, look at this poor man. He has edema in his scrotum. It's horrible, or as my boys call it, his nad bag. <laughs> he has elephantiasis, not elephantitis. Elephantitis is an inflamed elephant. Elephantiasis is a filarial infection, it is a round worm infection, it's a parasite. And these worms love to go into your lymphatic vessels and they live there and they block the drain. <coughs> and then that means the fluid has nowhere to go, except for staying in the interstitial space in areas where the skin is forgiving and will keep expanding. We saw that with the little girl with kwashiokor. That skin is very <coughs> forgiving. A man, those of you who have laptops, or your phones, go ahead, go on to YouTube. Put in the search engine for YouTube. Man with elephantiasis. Here's how you spell it. In his scrotum. Something like that should come up. If you pull up the video that I think it's going to give you, <clears throat> you will see this poor man, I think from India, in a sarong kind of outfit, tied around. And he's sitting, at, you found it! <laughs> and he's sitting like this. And then you see him starting to stand up. And you realize what he was sitting on was not a pillow. It was his scrotum. And as he stands up, are you seeing that? As he stands up, he starts to try and walk, <coughs> and the whole thing is just, look at I know she found it. <laughs> It's horrible, isn't it? Some guys like punching him up the stairs. I know. Now that's like, that's not just like a few milliliters of fluid. That's Those are gallons. Gallons. 
You can see his scrotal sac straining from the weight of all that fluid. It's horrible. People can have edema for a variety of reasons, just like they can have anemia for a variety of reasons. How you treat the edema is predicated upon which of those four sterling forces went awry. And Guyton Hall, I believe it's in chapter 23, actually itemizes all of those starling forces and says to you, this one's a problem and here's how it can become a problem. How can we get Kwashiorkor? Which starling force is the problem? This was unit one. Decreased capillary colloid osmotic pressure. Good, in your homework packet, pick that one. Kara, I don't see it where it says Kwashiorkor. Yeah, you do. Starved child, thank you. In unit one, I said, you know who else can have Kwashiorkor, but it's not from a diet? It could be because they have liver failure. Who was that person? The alcoholic. So pick that one. Carrie, I don't see the alcoholic on my list. Liver failure, thank you. So which force is the culprit? Thank you, good job. If I have right ventricular failure, blood is returning to the right atrium from the systemic circuit, and the right ventricle, what comes in, can't get kicked out, then where's the blood going to pool? Systemic. Now which force is the culprit? Why will your patient have systemic Edema. Ding! Both of you correct. If I have swollen feet at the end of the day, why? Which starling force is not my friend? Capillary hydrostatic pressure. Do you say to me, oh, Kara, oh my gosh, your feet are so swollen, you have edema. Here, let me give you an IV solution of albumin. Do I go home every night going, shoot? No, what do I do when I go home every night? I put my feet up. Yes, I do. I go straight to the recliner chair, I kick it way back, and I play words with friends, and I do my Sudoku and read the comic strip. That is what I do. And by the time I'm done, I, my feet feel better. Half the people I work with go, Carrie, you know why you get so swollen and your feet are so swollen at the end of the day? It's the damn shoes you wear. It's the heels you wear. That's the reason. And I go, and that's the fucking reason why you all don't teach physiology. Because nowhere in Guyton and Hall do they have causes of edema where it says high heels. <laughs> Zero! That's not the reason. It's because I don't go, hey, let's go. Hey, hey, let's go. But I should. Then I wouldn't have edema. What about elephantiasis? Does that directly impact one of the starling forces that I told you about? No. It's a totally different category. It is plain and simple obstruction of lymphatic vessels. It is not one of the starling forces that it's impacting. It's the French drain that has the toilet paper clogging it. Well, who else might lymphatic drainage be a problem for, for edema? Hmm. Good guess. Let me, let me, I'm gonna be a little X-rated. I don't mean anything personal. Oh no! I have breast cancer. We should also probably take out the lymphatic nodes and lymphatic vessels here because if the cancer metastasizes, this is probably where it's going to go. So let's just carve this whole area out. Now I don't have the French drain. And all the blood going to my arm has no way to drain out 
from the interstitial space because I have cut through lymphatic vessels. So people who have breast cancer and have a mastectomy, <coughs> if they cut out the lymphatic vessels, they get edema in the arm where they have cut off the breast. Do you know that? How do we help them? We give them compression bandages to help push the blood, the pl I should say the interstitial fluid, back up high enough where the lymphatic vessels are still there and it drains. Well, Kara, why do they get the edema in their, their arms? If it drains, because we don't walk like this. You know, tell a mastectomy person, just walk like this all day long. Hey, how you doing? I'm here. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Give them enough time. The lymphatic vessels will regrow, but it takes a long time. But that's not impacting the starling force. It is the drain being clogged or missing. So whenever we see edema, we say, which starling force is impacted? If none of those, is the French drain, is the lymphatic vessel obstructed, missing, what's going on? Because if you figure that out, then you go after that issue to help the edema. Okay, unbalanced ventricular output. You all told me if it's right ventricular failure, we will see edema in the systemic circuit. What if it's left ventricular failure? Where will the blood pool? Back to the left atrium, back into the pulmonary circuit, you will have pulmonary edema. And let me tell you that, it is very life-threatening. Now you're impacting gas exchange across the epithelial lining of the alveoli. That's serious. We need to rectify that if we can. Right <coughs> ventricular failure, where will we see the edema? Systemic. <coughs> so if it's a right-sided heart problem, where will you see the edema? If it's a right-sided heart problem, where will you see the edema? Good, systemic. If it's left-sided heart problem, where will we see the edema? Pulmonary. Good. And when, yes? Sorry, I just wanted to say, like, I keep like backing things up. I don't know how far to go. Because, like, if you back up in your pulmonary, it's like harder for your right atrium to put, or right vessel to push it out. But do you have back up systemically also? And that's when the heart failure starts to affect two different sides. But I'm not going to ask you to keep going, keep going. Where is the immediate problem? Okay, and we will practice more of that tonight. That is a great question. You are thinking correctly. <clears throat> if we have edema here, you're right. The right ventricle is going to have a harder time because blood will only flow from high pressure to low. Now it's going to have to hypertrophy, and it won't be healthy, and the right ventricle will start to fail. We have serious problems now. This is now building into congestive heart failure where both chambers are now weak as a pump. Yes, <laughs> good job. This goes with your homework packet. I'm gonna ask you which starling force is the issue. Not necessarily is it leading to edema. I'm just saying what is the issue? Which force is impacted? If you have high blood pressure, which force is going to be impacted? Capillary hydrostatic. Capillary hydrostatic pressure. Is that out or in? Out, so you would have more edema. People with high blood pressure, if it's not treated, look at their face. They start to get puffy in the face from the high blood pressure. Did you know that? Look at someone who has consumed too much alcohol over the weekend and then they show up for work on Monday morning. Do you know that drinking too much alcohol acutely has a reflexive, hypertensive response? So when you're drinking the alcohol, your blood vessels are like, oh yeah, this is awesome. Uh -huh. And then you do that all weekend long, and then come Monday morning, 
You see your coworker coming in who's huge and puffy faced. Puffy face. And their hair looks like Kramer because they could barely shower in the morning. No. Puffy. Too much alcohol. Reflex of hypertensive, hypertension. Then they get the edema even in their face. It's a dead giveaway. Now you're all like, hmm. I'm going to pay attention to that one. Starvation, that's our quashiocor. Histamine, remember that one, the distress signal? Histamine, allergies, vasodilate, increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, fluid dripping, fluid dripping. Not only that, but it leads to a KF change. So histamine, if, Julia, if you get that test where you have histamine, you need to mark two answers for me. Two, increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, increased KF. Mark two. What are some others? Burn, crushing injury. Haley, if you get that test question, you also need to give me two answers. Burns also increase the KF factor. Why? You burned through your capillary. It is definitely leaking. It also, <coughs> because you are leaking, the osmotic pressure, colloid osmotic pressure, and your cap the albumin molecules are going, we've never seen the other side of the capillary bed like this. It's amazing. We've never seen this side of the neighborhood. So you're oozing out your albumin, and the water follows the particles, Plus, there's no capillary with the external adventitia keeping the plasma in. That is the number one reason why patients with burn injuries die. They desiccate to death. They dehydrate to death. They have no skin, no capillary external adventitia to keep anything in. That is what kills them. We do have artificial skin. We do have the ability to give growth factors to try and get them to regrow their skin. But if their burns are so severe, law of nines, you can't keep that fluid in fast.